Hi, welcome to my second writing activity for the Royal Voluntary Services Virtual Village Hall. Before we get um, cracking on, on the writing prompts, I just want to remind you that this is really just a bit of fun, um, a way for us to be creative for a few hours while we're spending time at home. So don't worry too much about your handwriting, your spelling, the things that you're writing. Um, nothing that we do is wrong. Anything that you produce is fine. Um, and no one's going to see it unless you share it. And please do share if you've if you've typed up some of the pieces that you've written already. It'd be great if we could have them on the um, Facebook page to to look at and share with others. So the writing prompts I'm going to give today are going to be themed around food and shopping. And so if you've got a piece of paper and a pen or pencil, we'll begin. So we're going to start with a quick warm-up activity and I'm going to get you to write a list in the way that we did last time. Um, just a quick um, stream of consciousness, automatic writing list about the prompt that I give you. And uh, if you've got um, a timer, that would be helpful. The, as I said last week, the ticking of a timer is really good at getting you to just keep writing and not overthink about things. And so here we go. I have um, a prompt here that I'm going to show you. And I'd like you to write a list of everything that you can think of in relation to this, a tin of tomatoes. Um, so this is a tin of Napolina tomatoes in rich tomato juice. It's got a black label and um, a picture of red tomato on the front. And you, in your list, just write anything that automatically comes out of your um, your creative well as you're writing. And it could be things to think about. It could be a factual list of what the tin looks like, what it physically looks like, the colour, the shape, the type of um, opener that it's got on the top. It could be facts about the contents. It could be your thoughts about the contents. Maybe you like tomatoes, maybe you don't. It could be what they're used for. It could be in your list, you could write memories associated with tomatoes. Um, but also you could think outside the box a little bit and what the tin of tomatoes might represent. And I, I chose this because um, at the beginning of lockdown, it was one of the things that people were panic buying. And the first time I went into um, um, a local shop a few weeks after lockdown, I'd stayed in for a few weeks and then I went shopping and saw a shelf of these tin tomatoes and was quite amazed because I didn't think I'd be able to get any. So for me, it represents panic buying. Um, yep, something, what, what you might use them for, favourite recipes, whatever. Give yourself five to ten minutes, put your timer on and write me a list, everything you know about a tin of tomatoes. So there you go. I hope you um, managed to get a good list of ideas about tomatoes. Um, and that was a warm up activity to, to just get your pencil flowing and get you back into the habit of writing. But if you wanted to, you might have some ideas there that you'd like to pull out and work into something else. Maybe um, choose one, one thing on the list and expand it into a story or a, a memory or a poem, or as we, we said last week, take the list itself and turn it into a poem, tidying it up a little bit and turn it into a poem about tomatoes, whatever you'd like to do. But yeah, lists, lists are really good, a really good way to begin writing. For the next activity, I'd like you to tell me a shopping story. And um, there's quite a range of things that you could write about shopping. So I was thinking particularly about online shopping to start with. Um, and that reminded me when I first, when they first brought in online shopping um, and I wasn't very good at using the computer, I had some terrible experiences of accidentally ordering the wrong things um, because I didn't understand 
how much um, a jar contains. I, I accidentally ordered a catering size jar of Branston pickle once instead of an ordinary small one and it took us over a year to eat it. Um, and then there were substitutions that um, the shop would make when they hadn't got the thing that I'd ordered. Some of them were very strange indeed and my children's faces when they were having to eat packets of crisps that weren't the sort that they usually had or the flavour that they really liked. Um, there were some amusing times there. So um, have you ever ordered online shopping and had some disasters or amusing substitutions? Have you had to make do with um, unusual items that people have bought you currently if they're shopping for you and um, have had to get whatever's in the shop? Or haven't understood the things that you wanted you might want to write about what shopping what your usual routine is for shopping what supermarkets you like to go to whether you take a list or whether you follow the pattern of the shop and that helps you remember what you want whether you're really good at shopping or whether you're somebody who ends up being sucked in by the bargains that are around you and buying things that you don't need um, it's quite common for people to talk about the Lidley Audi effect and going in for your basic groceries and coming out with a head strimmer. Has anything like that ever happened to you? And if so, what was the weirdest thing that you ever bought that you didn't need in a supermarket? You might want to write about shopping when you were a child. What was shopping like when you were a child? Who did you go shopping with? What was the name of the shop? What was the setup in the shop? Was it one of the early supermarkets? I remember um, going supermarket shopping with my dad and it's been very different to how supermarkets are now, certainly. And then the shop at the opposite end of the, um, the small run of shops on our housing estate was the kind of shop where you waited in line and you were served one at a time and the shopkeeper wrapped up each individual purchase and then they went in a book, they were recorded in the book. My mother would sometimes send send us children round to go and get something that she'd run out of and ask that it be put in the book that she would settle at the end of the week. Um, and the kind of things that you bought were the kind of shopping that your family would have done when you were a child, are they very different to the shopping that you do now? And how? What, do you have strong memories of shopping in the past? So lots that we could do then. The daftest thing you've ever brought. I said that one. Uh, I think I've got, oh yeah. Try and remember. So if you're writing about shops, whether it's now or in the past, try and add some senses to your piece of writing. What does the, sm the shop smell like? What sort of noises would you have had? Certainly, um, shops the tills were very different when i was a child and they would have a very distinctive ring as as things were rung into them so if you would like to pause the video now and spend 10 10 15 minutes jotting notes rough first draft remember it doesn't have to be perfect of a shopping story I hope you managed to get a few ideas down about shopping that you'll be able to pull together into a piece later on. Um, I've got some examples to read to you um, that might you might want to use as a model. And the first is um, a poem. I created a list of things that I buy when I'm shopping and the route that I take around the supermarket. And then um, I found it quite hard to do anything with until I got a rhythm. I've bor borrowed um, a rhythm from another poem. And it is quite rough, but it's it's not it's a first draft, so a punnet of strawberries, red and juicy, three or four bananas depending on their size, a string bag of onions, red spuds, broccoli, organic carrots, good for the eyes. Knit by the free from aisle, see if they've they've a pork pie, a ready meal lasagna if they have any left, a tub of juicy olives nice ones from Italy, a pot of cheese and chive dip, the price pure theft. Up to the tins now, tomatoes, beans and sweet corn, across to the dairy aisle to get some milk, a small block of cheddar, a triangle of parmesan, 
double cream, yoghurt, butter smooth as silk, cereal, bread rolls, chocolate cake for Sunday, a family bag of pasta twirls to make a midweek tea, cider for the daughter, red bull for the teenager, smile to find the red wine is buy two, get third free. Queue up for the wide till, chatter with the till girl, pack away in bags for life, that's the shopping done. Trundle to the car park, stow away the shopping bags, boot shut, trolley stashed, drive off home. There you go. I tripped upon a few words there that I might need to change to make it easier to read out. That's one of the editing tricks. If your tongue can't say it properly, it needs a different word to go in. Okay, so the other pieces are um, bits that have been written by people in writing groups. And the first one is by Jean. It's a shop from my childhood. On Lincoln Street in 1954 was a marvellous shop with displays out front either side of the door which stood open in summer and opened with a creak and a buzzer in winter. Outside were biscuits of all shapes, sizes, colours and tastes which I only discovered later were dog biscuits. The aroma inside was incredible, a mixture of bacon, varying from meaty when new and cold to a vaguely de decaying acid smell in hot weather, cheese which stood large and unwrapped on the counter, bread baked daily in the small hours, and tea in square open chests. The sugar was scooped into blue packets or in a hard oblong, also blue wrapped, which we had to beat with the rolling pin to put in our tea. The crisps had packets of salt, also blue, and everything was weighed, wrapped, put into a brown bag, and the price written on it in pencil. So that's a memory from childhood. Memories of a newsagent's. Miss Armston in Quorn had gaslighting in the shop when I took papers for her in 1968, and her brother had come in, light this thing, and whoosh, up it had go, and I think, there's going to be a bonfire there. My dad knew a bit about electrics and he went to help them and when I asked, how did you get on? He said they'd got the old round two pin. They hadn't even got the three pin stuff in. There was a lady out the back who used to write the numbers on the paper and I never did see her. A Miss Armston used to wear this thing that wraps round to her, an overall, and if I get a whiff of an old newspaper now, it takes me right back. I used to come home down to the cross and even though it had gone to be a restaurant now, I could still see her standing outside putting the stuff out. And that was Chris. Hello. I recall doing something that wasn't honest once and it has plagued me ever since. When I lived in Wumwell, I had a joey, a three penny piece to spend. I went into a shop to buy something I'd seen in the window, probably sweets gave the shopkeeper the money to pay for it and was given three pence change. She probably thought I had given her a sixpence piece and even though I knew it, I should have given it back, I cheated her and kept it for myself. Doing that has plagued me ever since and ever since that one time I have always given back any money that wasn't mine. And that was Roy. So the last thing I'm going to get you to do is to write about food and it could be a memory of food, so a memory of something you had in your childhood or in your earlier years, the first time you had something. Can you remember the first time you had a curry for instance or a Chinese meal? I can remember the first time I had spaghetti. And young people find it hard to believe that um, spaghetti wasn't uh, an everyday foodstuff in my early childhood. Had it as, I had it as a teenager. Um, a food that you hate, a food that you really love, a food that you're really missing and can't wait to have. So that at the end of lockdown when you can get out and go and buy whatever you like or go and eat in a restaurant... Um, what would be the thing that you're craving that you would you want to get out there and have 
the food stuff that you choose what is it what does it taste like what does it smell like what does it look like what were your first thoughts the first time you had it did you like the look of it did you think it looked odd where did you eat it was it something you first had at home or in a restaurant or when you went away on holiday or you went to stay with somebody or you moved away who were you with when you first had it and um, another thing you could think of is how would you make it if it was a meal that you particularly like? Could you um, write the recipe for it? Recipes are a really good way to structure a piece of writing um, because you can write the, the factual part of step by step how you make something, but you can also uh, weave in bits of story around it. And I've got an example of that here. Um, this is by Patricia and she's writing about jam. One of the foods which is part of my history is jam and the palava of making it. Usually, jam makers use a large pan known as a maslin pan. I've never used one. My jam making is restricted to cooking the fruit in a pressure cooker, usually using three pound of fruit, three pound of sugar, plus water. This makes a batch of jam around five and a half pounds. Cook the washed fruit for the right time. Look it up. Probably five minutes at £10 pressure. Can't do it myself nowadays. Arthritis means I can't lift. Cool rapidly. Cold tap. Stir. Remove fruit stones if needed. And similar weight of sugar and cook on the hot plate. Stirring frequently until the mix thickens. And then cool a teaspoonful on a cold plate or saucer. If the surface crinkles, the jam is near setting point. Meanwhile, someone helpful, do you know any, will have washed all the jam jars you will need, got rid of all the labels, etc., and dried and weighed them, then placed them in a warm oven, each one with a small label on, giving the weight. Use a jug to transfer the hot jam into the weighed jars, Leave to cool, then top with a waxed paper circle and a clean label, obtainable at good grocers and also newsagents. To be reweighed and labelled with whatever the mix of fruit happened to be. Apricot and rock gooseberry was very popular. Calculate the selling price from the cost of the fruit and sugar. So that's a good use of a recipe there, it gave us glimpse, glimpses of Patricia's life. Um, I have here a memory from David, and this is called Hot Dog. In the early part of the 1960s, well before the town was full of fast food outlets, one had to know where to grab something to eat in the late evening. So, in leaving the Odeon Cinema, it was a short walk to the end of Churchgate to Jock's. Jock's hot dog stand did the very finest examples of those American concoctions that two shillings could buy. Jock was a wonderful man with a kind attitude and was happy to join in with whatever banter was going on. The hot dogs consisted of minced beef with quite a lot of onion, a huge splat of hot and very yellow mustard on top. Now I would gladly give five pound for one of Jock's hot dogs. And the other also by another David is called Hobson's Choice. Twenty years ago, I spent two weeks working at a theological college in Kenya. As well as training priests, the college also taught secretarial and accounting skills to local school leavers so that they would have a chance of finding work when they had to leave the family land and go into towns and cities. The college also wanted to teach woodwork and metalwork to other youngsters and we had fundraised to build two classrooms where these skills could be taught. As well as seeing these new classrooms and being there for the formal opening, we were also asked to do some decorating and some teaching of the, of the theology students, five of our group being ministers. We were invited to join the students for lunch and I mentioned to the principal that I was a vegetarian and I hoped that this wouldn't be a problem. No problem at all, he replied. Everyone is vegetarian here. We can't afford meat. And a very good lunch it was, at least for me. So there, some memories that you could perhaps use as models 
or I'm sure you've got ideas of your own. So pause the film and get writing. So I've come to the end of my writing prompts today and I hope you enjoyed those and uh, you uh, w had a good time being creative and scribbling down a few memories and a few thoughts. Before I go, I said I'd have a quick word about editing this week. So um, when you look back at, at a piece that you've written, you need to go into your analytical brain and assess how well it works for somebody reading it somebody who doesn't have your knowledge of the um, experience that you're sharing in your piece of writing. So first thing to do, read it aloud. It's a really good technique. And as I did with my poem earlier, if when you're reading it, you're finding some words trip you up, they don't flow off your tongue as easily as they should. It's usually an indication that they need changing. Um, so swap them around. It might mean swapping sentences around um, check for repetition that you haven't used the same word a few times um, because again that snags the reader when they're listening to them it gets them out of the flow of the story that they're listening to tighten up the writing as much as you can take out as many small words as you can particularly with poetry the fewer the words the better in poetry so that it's boiled down just to the idea, the main idea that you're wanting to get across in your poem, your one theme. And um, I, I, a technique that I sometimes use is I like pretend that you are writing the piece to pay to have it put in the newspaper as you would in an advert and that you're going to be paying per word and you want your bill to be as small as possible. So cut your piece down to the smallest amount of words that you can while still keeping it, the sense of the piece and while it still makes sense. And some of the words that you can take out, you can often take out that and the and a ah and play around with it. One, one trick is to set yourself a word limit, so reduce it to 100 words and then have a go at knocking another 10 words off and then another 10 and then another 10. See how small you can get it with it still making sense. Thanks for joining me today. Don't forget that if you'd like to share the pieces that you've created today, you're very welcome to upload them to us on the Virtual Village Hall Facebook page. If you just um, cut and paste any text into a comment underneath this video or record them on your phone, record yourself reading your pieces and share those with us too. We'd love to see them and hopefully I'll see you again next time. Bye.